Now we're recording. This session is being recorded for training and record keeping purposes. By participating in this session, you are consenting to the recording, retention, and use of this session. At any time you have a question or a comment, feel free to place that in the chat box. And we will respond to you as soon as possible. If you would like to ask your question or to comment verbally, please note that by doing so, you are consenting to the recording, retention, and use of your statements recorded as part of this session. Now, you've probably noticed I've muted everybody, so um, asking the question verbally is not going to be an option today. Please feel free to uh, place your questions in the chat box, and then we'll address them at the end of the talk. I put in um, at the very top of the chat box the uh, email address that you can um, contact Mr. McBurney directly uh, to receive or to, uh, I'm sorry, hold on, hold on. That's embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> to purchase a signed copy of the book. We do not have signed copies at the park. So the only way for you can uh, for you to purchase the um, a signed copy is to contact Mr. McBurney through the um, through that web uh, that email address. I'm getting a request now for people, other people, participants, to please turn your videos off if you don't mind. And with that, I'm going to read this uh, introduction. Mr. McBurney was raised in Kingston, Rhode Island. And in high school, he made his first attempt into writing by penning a book on the history of Kingston. After graduating high school, he attended Brown University where he wrote a 300 page thesis on Colonial South Kingstown Planner Society. After graduating from New York University School of Law, he embarked on a career as, as an attorney. Currently, he lives in Kensington, Maryland with his family. In 2004, he revisited his high school effort and published a new version of the history of Kingston. Some of his other books include Kidnapping the Enemy, The Special Operations to Capture Generals Charles Lee and Richard Prescott, which I happen to have a copy of here. <laughs> and also the Rhode Island campaign and uh, several other books. Today, we're going to be discussing the court martial of General Charles Lee and his relationship with George Washington and the new book, George Washington's Memoirs. There it is. And you can get your own signed copy if you email him. So with that, I turn this over to you and... Here we have uh, Christian McBurney. Well, thank you. You're Kim, welcome. It's, uh, great to be here. And um, I'm very happy it's raining where most of you are. So it, it increases the audience, so that's great. Um, I'm gonna share my screen so I can uh, get my PowerPoint up. Hopefully we won't have a problem with that. I don't think we will. Okay. Good, okay, that's great. All right, and um, as uh, Kimberly said, several, uh, several, a number of you have already uh, contacted me about getting a signed book and I got it out pretty quickly, $20 plus $4 shipping. So uh, very, very pleased about that and glad to take more orders, just email Kimberly. She also uh, noticed the Kidnapping the Enemy book, the special operations to capture generals Charles Lee and Richard Prescott. I believe that was on sale at the Washington's Crossing gift shop for several years. So that's maybe why you had a copy, uh, Kimberly. Um, now, both of those books, um, I think I'm, I'm trying to do a, uh, essentially it's a biography of Charles Lee, if you put them together. Um, and in that book, I said I was going to do another book about Charles Lee committing treason and whether or not his post-captivity court-martial conviction was fair. So this book, George Washington's Nemesis, fulfills that pledge. Uh, both books, again, tried to provide a balanced account of Charles Lee. He's definitely one of the most interesting characters of the Revolutionary War. And he was second in command only to George Washington for most of the time of his service. There are two uh, longer um, uh, bios of uh, Charles Lee. One of them thinks he's the greatest thing since sliced bread. The other one says that he's the worst thing since, uh, well, you, you, you name it. 
I think it's more important to be balanced. And uh, I personally think he did commit treason, and I think that's an issue. On the other hand, I think his conviction after the Battle of Monmouth was unwarranted. Uh, so I think it's important to, uh, you know, to be objective in dealing with him. Both issues are legal ones. I'm an attorney, so that's helpful. There's the law and the applicable facts, and you apply the, the facts to the law. A lot of the facts, excuse me. Now, prior to the war, Charles Lee had been a lieutenant colonel in the British Army. He served in North America during the French and Indian War. Afterwards, he served as a soldier of fortune in Poland, Russia, and Turkey. Here's a, a great image of him. Uh, his friend called it the best likeness of him. Um, so you can tell he was thin and he had a large nose. Uh, this is probably the only image of him from life. Um, so uh, he, he was, wasn't considered particularly handsome. That is his Pomeranian dog, Spado. So uh, he was considered odd in those years because he liked dogs. Now, now of course, everyone loves dogs, especially during the pandemic. But um, uh, back then it was seen as odd. and. Uh, so that was uh, another characteristic because he, he thought they were dogs were more honest than people. So I guess you know, hard to hard to disagree with that. Uh, now he was born in England. He moved to America in 1773, and in 1775, Congress selected him as a major general in the Continental Army, and he had more experience in the military affairs because he had been this soldier of fortune, and he had more a better education than any American general. On December 13, 1776 while spending the night at a tavern at Basking Ridge, New Jersey, three miles from the main body of his division. Lee was surprised by British dragoons, captured after a brief but violent struggle with his guards and spirited away. And he was eventually brought to New York City and confined, confined to two rooms in New York City. Uh, the Kidnapping the Enemy book, of course, uh, is a lot about this as well as an American effort to uh, kidnap a British major general to exchange for Lee. Great story. Now, uh, what's wrong with this picture? Here's a picture of uh, uh, Lee surrendering his sword to Colonel Harcourt, a uh, good friend of the King George III's. What's wrong with the picture? Well, Lee's wearing a red coat and Harcourt and his dragoons are wearing blue coats. It really should be switched around, but uh, it's great to have a color picture. Now, the key to understanding Lee's treason is that after his capture, he went underwent a dramatic change of mindset. Prior to the war, he had been a strong proponent of Republican government and a fierce critic of monarchical rule. Uh, after moving to America in 1773, he became one of the most ardent Whig leaders. He was uh, a very early proponent of independence, way before most delegates in the uh, Continental Congress. He also um, uh, published a very influential pamphlet in which he said that the militia, who they were used to, they grew up with guns, could outduel British regulars who didn't. Uh, as second in command, he was confident that the America's militia's ability could defeat the British Army. But by the third month of his imprisonment in New York, he had changed his views about the ability of the Americans to secure their independence. He considered the American battle, uh, Army's very bad defeat at the Battle of Long Island, where militiamen had run away. Uh, the British Army had then easily taken New York City, then it chased Washington's army out of New Jersey and across the Delaware River. Lee lost confidence in Washington as a commander. Indeed, the very morning of his capture, he wrote Lee, uh, uh, his friend Horatio Gates, a letter criticizing Washington. Now he considered America's best hope himself was unavailable because he was now a prisoner. Lee now believed that the Americans could not defeat the British and should therefore end the bloodshed and rejoin the American empire. Lee decided to handwrite a military plan designed for the British to conquer America quickly. When he finished, Lee handed his uh, written document to Henry Strachey. And since May, May 1776, Strachey was uh, secretary to Admiral Lord Richard Howe, who was the commander of the British Navy, the Royal Navy in North America. And Howe, Richard Howe was the brother of William Howe, who was the commander of the British Army in North America. They were both uh, also called royal commissioners in, in order to accept their posts. They said, well, we want to act as royal commi peace commissioners. Uh, they desperately wanted uh, peace with Americans and, and to bring back the uh, Brit uh, Americans in the fold. And Strachey was the secretary to the peace commissioners. So Lee knew that his plan was going to be handed 
to the house, or at least be known to the house. Uh, straight the, uh, um, put the uh, document uh, on his desk and he wrote Mr. Lee's plan, 29 March, 1777. This plan is at the uh, New York Public Library. So it was a lot of fun to hold it and, uh, and look at the original. There's little reason to doubt that the authenticity of the document, uh, Lee didn't sign it, but that's because he didn't want anyone to uh, come across it with his name on it. Uh, but it's not disputed that it's in his handwriting. And also he, many of the same views that he uh, presents in this plan, uh, he held throughout his 15 month captivity. Uh, Lee began his nearly eight page plan admitting that he had sincerely and zealously abandoned the American cause. He justified submitting his plan to the house in an effort to spare American blood in the, in the war that patriots can never win in his view. I quote, as on the one hand, it appears to me, and here's um, the original, you can follow from the top there. As on the hand, one hand, it appears to me that by the continuance of the war, America has no chance of obtaining the end she proposes to herself, i.e. independence, that although by struggling, she may put the mother country to very serious expense, both in blood and money, yet she must in the end, after great desolation, havoc and slaughter, be reduced to submit to terms much harder than might, might probably be granted at present. So uh, he was hoping that the house would be very generous. Uh, Lee next explained that Britain too had an interest in ending the war quickly, uh, even though he was confident it would ultimately win. I quote, as on the other hand, Great Britain, though ultimately victorious, must suffer very heavily, even in the process of her victories, every life lost and every guinea spent being in fact worse than thrown away. It is only wasting her own property, shedding her own blood and destroying her own strength. Now Lee believed that America could obtain generous peace terms with the Howes. He, he, I quote, uh, based on the high opinion I have of the humanity and good sense of Lord and General Howe. He was persuaded that the terms of accommodation will be as moderate as their powers will admit. And the Howes weren't known as moderates, not, not as uh, you know, real uh, right wingers who wanted to crush the rebellion. Most of Lee's plan contained the steps he believed would most quickly lead to the defeat of the Americans and the end of the war. I don't want to get into that. I don't have time. Of course, it's in the book. Uh, Lee ended his introduction using strong language to attempt to persuade the house of the sincerity of his beliefs. He assured them that he would most sincerely and zealously contribute all in my power to accomplish the return of the Americans to the British foe. And he boldly concluded I will answer my life for the success. Now, Lee sincerely thought that ending the war quickly was in the best interest of America. Even so, it's difficult to arrive at any other conclusion that Lee committed rank treason uh, under the recently enacted Articles of War. A lot of historians have just kind of fluffed over this episode in Lee's career and ignored it, maybe spent a couple sentences on it, especially you know the book that uh, uh, really uh, praised his uh, service, uh, but I don't think that's right. Uh, but he never had to uh, face the issue in his lifetime as his written plan was not discovered until 75 years after his death. They were discovered in the Henry Strachey papers uh, uh, many years later. Now treason is a crime. Crime is set out in the laws. Uh, here's the applicable provision of the articles of war that applied to Lee. Article 19 of section 13 provided that whosoever shall be convicted of holding correspondence with or giving intelligence to the enemy, either directly or indirectly, shall suffer death or such other punishment as by court martial shall be inflicted. So it's basically uh, holding a correspondence with the enemy. That's the main point. The author of the most authoritative treatise on American military justice, William Winthrop, discusses the requirements. First, uh, Winthrop wrote that a letter to the soldier to the enemy satisfied the need for correspondence. Second, he concluded that a mutual exchange of letters was not needed, just sending the one letter was enough. Third, it was not necessary to find that the letter was treacherous, injurious, or calculated to encourage the enemy. The provision simply made it an offense to engage in any correspondence with the enemy. And uh, Winthrop added, the crime is complete in the writing and preparing of the letter and the committing of it to a messenger or otherwise putting it in the way to be delivered. It is not essential that it be received by the person for whom it is intended. 
So it seems clear that Lee met all of these requirements. As to the last requirement, Lee met, uh, he, he meant uh, when he handed it to uh, Henry Strachey or to a British guard, to be that they that plan would be forwarded to British officials, and he essentially wrote it to the Howe brothers. Uh, Lee had met Strachey in early February, so neither of the Howe brothers actually had to have read the military plan uh, in order for Lee to have violated uh, the article. Uh, still, uh, you know, we don't know if they did read it. And here's a picture of General Howe. In reality, to be convicted of treason, especially to be hanged, correspondence needed to be either treacherous or secret. Now, Lee's submission of his military plan, I, I say, met both. The Continental Army second in command had revealed what he thought were the weak points of the American resistance for the Howe brothers to exploit. He also gave some pretty specific uh, facts about where to land troops and that kind of thing. His plan by his own terms was intended to influence William Howe's military strategy in the upcoming campaign for Howe to seize Philadelphia. Thus he intended Howe to rely on it in order, as he stated in the plan, uh, to end the war as quickly as possible. His conduct in delivering his plan to Strachey was in a word unconscionable. Now some would question whether Lee committed treason. They find it odd that uh, Lee's plan appearing in Strachey's files after the war, there's no other mention of it in British records. Usually uh, when British uh, army or admiral or general had reviewed a document, there'd be a marking on it that he had done so. There are no such markings here. And it, it, isn't, it isn't clear either the Howes read it. Sure, they knew about it, Strachey would have told them about it. But again, it's not relevant to whether Lee should be convicted, whether or not uh, uh, they read it. Those who uh, question that Lee committed treason also wonder why even after the war, no British general mentioned Lee's plan. They could have said, you know, I'll, get, I'll show you guys, hey, you don't need, didn't even know that one of your main generals committed treason. Well, in those days, uh, there was a gentleman code for British senior officers and Lee came forward in good faith. Uh, he did exactly what British officers wanted American officers to do, and that is to, uh, you know, work for peace and to end the rebellion and bring America back. And uh, it also wouldn't have been good for future wars if uh, British generals were known to expose uh, persons who did that kind of thing, exactly what they wanted to do. And I actually in the book go over some other situations of other Americans who, who were in the same situation and the British never exposed them. Now, Lee was not, uh, as his treason wasn't as bad as the most notorious traitor in American history. Who was that? Here he is, Benedict Arnold. And this is the only known image of Arnold from life. So and all the other ones you see are, are not from life. Arnold was paid 6,000 pounds in today's money, more than $1.2 million to turn traitor. Uh, Lee uh, obviously he did not get that money. Uh, Arnold openly took up arms against America. He fought uh, American troops in Connecticut and Virginia, 1781. After the war, he moved to England. Lee did none of these things. Still, it's possible to commit treason without joining the opposing side. All Congress required for a conviction was a uh, treacherous correspondence with the enemy. Lee had done that when he submitted his plan to Henry Sprakey. Lee, the soldier of fortune, very cleverly kept his options open. If the British won the war, here he's uh, making a good faith effort to uh, uh, bring America back to the fold. Maybe he could avoid um, uh, hanging and maybe even keep his uh, estates in England. If instead he was released back to the Americans, he could return as uh, second in command. So keeping all this secret from, uh, and not public was uh, important for Lee. It's crucial to understand that Lee's beliefs that the Americans should negotiate an end to the war uh, renounced the Declaration of Independence and returned to the British fold, continued throughout his 15 month captivity. He acted on his beliefs too, writing letters and meeting with senior British generals. Thus his military plan was not uh, just a uh, momentarily lark or resulting from a temporarily weakened state of mind. Maybe he was worried about being hanged. These continued efforts to encourage peace negotiations are further proof that he had a treacherous intent. 
Now, consistent with Lee's dramatic transformation of his mindset, in early February 1777, Lee sent a letter to the Continental Congress requesting that a small delegation meet him in British New York City for public good. Clearly, that was to negotiate and end the hostilities. There had been one other previous meeting uh, between a congressional delegation and Lord Richard Howe on Staten Island. And here, here's that uh, picture of that, September, 7, September 1777. Uh, here you can see Lord Richard Howe meeting Ben Franklin, John Adams, and uh, Charles Pickney, South Carolina. In a letter written a month after this meeting occurred, Lee had lambasted the Continental Congress for ever, even sending the delegation to sit down with Lord Howe. He called it ridiculous that Lord Howe would have any reasonable terms to offer. Now he was requesting another such conference. Had anything changed? No. Sometime during the period from mid 1777 to the early fall of that year, while still a captive, evidence strongly indicates that Lee sent a letter to his relative in Britain, Sir Charles Bunbury. He was a member of the House of Commons. This letter explained how the Americans could be forced to negotiate an end to the war. Bunbury, who opposed the American war in Congress, uh, in the House of Parliament, actually read the letter in a session of the British Parliament. Other historians have ignored Bunbury's speech, probably because of the underlying letter has never been found. But I think it should not be ignored. It is likely that Bunbury uh, would, unlikely that he would brazenly lie to the House of Commons. Moreover, the message conveyed in Bunbury's speech was consistent with Howe's mindset at the time. Luckily for Lee, no one on the American side picked up that uh, Bunbury had uh, made this uh, uh, exposure of British Parliament. Some of it was printed uh, in American papers uh, in the 1780s. In early 1778, Lee once more submitted in writing to British commanders in New York City his offer to serve as a moderator to end the war. It was a long letter. By this time, he now thought the Americans could win the war. He thought they could do so by avoiding major defeats by staying away from the British army. Yet he still desired a negotiated peace. And still he wanted uh, America to renounce the Declaration of Independence and return to crown rule. In a lengthy and disturbing letter to James Robertson, the British military commander in New York City, Lee explained why he believed the war should end. He reiterated that continuing the war would ruin Great Britain because of the heavy expense and vast debt needed to win the war on the battlefield. On the other hand, Lee argued the United States would similarly suffer in the event she won the war for anarchy and civil wars would follow. So he believed even if America won, there would be between the loyalists and the patriots, there'd be a bloody continuation of the war. On uh, May 22nd, 1778, Lee met with the senior British general in New York City. Oh, here's, the, here's uh, Charles Benbury's uh, picture of uh, his uh, uh, discussion of, that Lee wanted to uh, uh, get America back in the fold. This is a printed version of the debates in Parliament. Here's Henry Clinton. And I discovered that uh, Clinton wrote a memorandum summarizing the discussions he had with Lee in March of 1778. This is the first time this memorandum has been published in a history book. In June 1778, after Lee's release back to the American side, Lee sent letters to Clinton and a new peace commissioner just arrived from London. And how these letters were delivered is not known. It's, it was highly secret correspondence. Lee's secret correspondence with British commanders both during and after his captivity probably also committed, uh, amounted to treason. A senior general should have leeway to negotiate a secession of hostilities, uh, but a senior general should not have leeway to negotiate, um, unless authorized by his government, a permanent peace between the warring parties. Only Congress had that authority and it did not delegate that power to Lee. Uh, unlike the Howe brothers, civil authorities never appointed Lee a peace commissioner. Thus his correspondence uh, might have also risen to a level, level of treacherous correspondence. In any event, it was secret, that, that should be enough to convict him as well. Now Lee eventually realized that he made a mistake. He never committed again, trying to write up a secret military plan. And many great men make awful impulsive mistakes. Such a, a mistake does not necessarily make up the totality of the man, even if the mistake was a very serious one, such as treason. 
The Philadelphia signer of the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Rush, noted the good and bad qualities in Lee. And he recognized that he was useful in the beginning of the war by inspiring our citizens with military ideas and lessening in our soldiers their superstitious fear of the valor and discipline of the British Army. They also did, Lee also did effective military work in the field, in the military theaters in Boston, New York, Virginia, and South Carolina, and at the Battle of White Plains in New York. Uh, and as explained later in this book, Lee performed a crucial service to the Whig cause at the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse in New Jersey. Still, to gain a complete portrait of the man, it must be understood that Charles Lee committed treason when, as a prisoner, he submitted his plan to his captors, explaining how they could defeat the American army, crush the rebellion, and end the American independence movement. Okay. About two thirds of the book focuses on Lee's generalship at the Battle of Monmouth Courthouse and his subsequent court martial. I'm not gonna spend as much time on this topic as I did on the treason. So Lee's treason was never discovered. So he was able to be released in April, 1778 and he rejoined the army as its second in command. Uh, after his return, he was given command of some of the finest troops in the army and with orders by General Washington to uh, attack the rear of Henry Clinton's army. Clinton's army was retreating from Philadelphia to New York. It was going to uh, um, be picked up uh, by Lord Howe's Navy in the, on the coast of New Jersey. Uh, now Lee fully intended to attack on June 28, 1778, but he decided to retreat to more defensible ground at the last second. He retreated in part because two of his generals, Charles Scott and William Maxwell, without orders and without informing Lee, removed their soldiers from the field. So more than half of his force suddenly disappeared. He also retreated because of Clinton's bold move to reverse his march and send some of his best troops to attack Lee's now outnumbered forces. Faced with the prospect of the remainder of his men being pinned against the ravine and possibly destroyed, Lee ordered a general retreat. Retreats are not easy to, to, to order if you're a general officer. Lee was very proud, but sometimes it's the right move. At the same time, he organized an effective delaying action that helped to stall the British advance. And in doing so, Lee saved his force, thereby performing a crucial service for the Patriot cause. Here's a, a picture of the swamp at the Monmouth battlefield that you can see today. So there's, uh, that was uh, the type of ravine that Lee's men would have had to have crossed if uh, they had been attacked. Uh, here's a battle map. Uh, there, there are eight battle maps in the book. Uh, so really uh, gives you a good idea of the Battle of Monmouth. It's got the longest chapters on the Battle of Monmouth. Here you can see Maxwell Brigades and Scott's detachment are retreating. And uh, so really it's, to me, the Battle of Monmouth is one of the most fascinating battles of the entire war. Uh, complicated, but I think these maps really make it more clear. Here's the hedgerow where some of the main action occurred. Lee created a, uh, a delaying action here. Some of the, it was definitely the fiercest action of the entire battle. The Americans uh, fought very well. Uh, it's a very nice battlefield if you've ever been there. Um, uh, is that a problem? Kimberly, can you hear that noise? Can you get back on the line, Kimberly? I don't hear anything in the background. You're fine. Okay. Someone's started to mow my lawn. So. <laughs> uh, now, uh, after the Battle of Bottom Courthouse, Lee was charged with failing to attack the enemy and making an unnecessary and, uh, and in some cases disorderly retreat. His most virulent, virulent detractor was Charles uh, uh, Scott, the guy who was largely responsible for the, the retreat, and also a confused Anthony Wayne, and two of Washington's brilliant but young and inexperienced aides, Alexander Hamilton and John Lawrence. Here's a portrait of William Sterling. He was the president of the court martial, good friend of uh, George Washington's. And also uh, he was in the battle too. So to the extent Lee was criticized, he would have benefited to some extent. So not sure why he was made president. Now in finding Lee guilty of all charges lodged against him, 
the court martial judges failed to implement impartial military justice. Uh, they apparently decided the case, the case on non-military grounds. Lee had imprudently made the matter a political one between George Washington and himself. Only one man uh, could succeed and the truth mattered little. Of course, Washington was much more important to the Patriot cause than Lee. Lee was convicted on all counts and suspended from the Continental Army for one year. Here's a great drawing from, uh, by uh, Kosciuszko, the Polish volunteer. It's called the Suspended General. You can see the writing there. And he's uh, stuck in a boot there, so he's, he's been suspended. And you can see his uh, proboscis is rather large here too. He's got his hair tied back. Uh, I tried to find out if Kosciuszko ever met Lee in person, but uh, I, I did not succeed in, uh, and uh, had no evidence of it. Now, after the approval of the verdict by Congress as a result of dramatic confrontations in the court martial proceedings, Lee faced challenges to duel with John Lawrence, Anthony Wayne, and Baron von Steuben. Lawrence and Lee actually fought a duel, and Lawrence slightly wounded Lee. Alexander Hamilton barely avoided a duel with one of Lee's outraged aides. Here's a nice uh, portrait of John Lawrence, a very uh, attractive, intelligent young man. He uh, tried to get South Carolina to uh, raise a uh, battalion of slaves to free them and, and allow them to fight in the Patriot cause, but South Carolina did not agree. Uh, but uh, Lawrence did not like that Lee used harsh language against Washington. And even though under the code duello, the code of duels, that Washington had to fight his own battles, Lee decided that he would still duel with Lawrence. Okay. Here's um, a statue of General von Steuben. Obviously, uh, uh, you at uh, Washington's Crossing area and, and Valley Forge, you're very familiar with uh, von Steuben. He did a great job uh, training Continental Army in Valley Forge. And the Battle of Monmouth was the first time that uh, the American Army had a significant engagement after this training. And the American Army performed very well, as you, as you can read it in my book. Now, why does he have a statue? Lee, in his um, uh, closing argument, said that von Steuben had been a distant spectator at the battle. As was often typically the case with Lee, he was accurate, but overly harsh. Uh, von Steuben, uh, in fact, was a distant spectator, but he took offense and um, uh, challenged Lee to a duel, but fortunately it never came off. Here is uh, Anthony Wayne. Um, he was uh, definitely a, a, a military man, but this was not his best battle. During the battle, Lee wanted to send the American forces around the rear of the British Army, uh, uh, the British um, uh, advance force, and trap it. And he wanted Wayne to hold the British uh, advance force in place, but Wayne kept calling for more troops, but that wasn't Lee's plan. So Lee uh, kind of made fun of Wayne. Uh, for making those claims uh, during the battle. And of course, that again, uh, he was accurate, but harsh. And, and so Wayne challenged Lee to a duel. Fortunately, these uh, two gentlemen made up and when uh, Wayne uh, won the battle at uh, Paoli, uh, not Paoli, uh, Stony Point, um, Lee congratulated uh, and the two made up. Now, other historians have uh, recognized that the court martial verdict was unfair and a travesty in justice. But this is the first book to really delve into the details of the uh, court martial itself. And so we really you know, we got uh, 300 pages of testimony from all the officers just two weeks after the battle. So it's a great resource. It's also the first book to really put the blame where I think it belongs on Charles Scott and William Maxwell. And in refusing to ask the court martial members to reconsider the verdict on the first two charges after he read the transcript, George Washington, it was also not his finest hour. It was the Revolutionary War's most scandalous court-martial and one of the most unfair in American military history, I believe. Nonetheless, much of the blame for the court-martial lies with Charles Lee himself. He failed on the day of battle to keep his commander-in-chief properly informed of the changed circumstances at the front. And because of that, Washington was surprised to see retreating soldiers. And they had a famous testy confrontation between the generals. I'll get into that later. 
Lee in turn could not brook the stain on his reputation from that exchange. And he impulsively and unwisely requested a court martial to clear his reputation while simultaneously insulting his commander, making a contest between the Continental Army's highest ranking generals. <coughs> Had a little bit of allergy. Sometimes you have to be careful what you ask for. He asked for a court martial. At his court martial, Lee tried to put the blame on the retreat on uh, where it belonged, on Charles Scott. But the gruff and rough, rough frontier leader from Virginia, here's the drawing of him, uh, he had a very strong personality and he resisted and he turned the tables and blamed Lee and Washington believed Scott, a friend of his. Scott got to Washington first after the battle. Scott's grudge against Lee for exposing his unwarranted retrograde movement at the court martial continued for many years after the war. <clears throat> As an elderly man in the early 19th century, Scott con concocted a fanciful story about how Washington at their first meeting during the Battle of Monmouth, Washington swore at Lee. Now here's a famous painting by Emanuel Leutze of Washington meeting Lee. You can see Washington on the brown horse and a downcast Lee is on a white horse. Uh, and here's the image, this is a well-known image. Uh, so I decided to use another one for the cover of my book. And this is uh, John Ward's Dunmore's painting in the early 1900s uh, of, of the meeting. And it's in the, held by Francis Tavern. And uh, you can see uh, Washington on a white horse this time. And Lee, this time is not backing down. He's looking right at General Washington. Now here's the entire quote from Scott's recollections when asked if General Washington ever swore. Yes, once it was at Monmouth and on a day that would have made any man swear. Yes, sir, he swore on that day till the leaves shook on the trees. Charming, delightful. Never have I enjoyed such swearing before or since. Sir, on that ever, ever memorable day, he swore like an angel from heaven. Now, Scott was not even an eyewitness to this exchange. His, he and his troops were a half a mile away. Historically, his story is complete, completely refuted by the testimony of officers who were, in fact, present at this exchange and who testified only two weeks later at a trial. And then, you know, you can read about it in the book. Yet many historians continue to repeat the story as if it were true or could be true. Unlike Washington, Scott was known for using crude language. In 1792, when Washington was considering whom to appoint as commander of the United States Army in the Northwest Territory, according to historian Mary Stockwell, he considered General Scott, but dismissed him as a drunkard better known for his foul mouth than for any bravery on the battlefield. Indeed, Scott's fanciful story was in response to a friend of his who was trying to cure Scott of his bad hat habit of swearing. The uh, friend asked if Washington ever swore, hoping to show that Scott should follow Washington's pristine example. Thus Scott's story insulted both Washington saying he swore and Lee saying he was sworn at and was an attempt to put himself in a better light by bringing Washington down to his level. And also he insulted religion by saying that angels swear. So it was a remarkable performance by the conniving Scott. I don't wanna go into too much detail about the battle uh, or the court martial. The battle, again, it's the longest chapter is on the Battle of Monmouth. Uh, I will end with a story about Alexander Hamilton and Charles Lee. They hated each other. Here's a very nice portrait of a young <clears throat> Hamilton in, in 1777, so a year before the battle. Uh, some historians claim that Hamilton lied on the court martial stand, uh, but I don't think he did. On, on a key uh, matter, Hamilton actually supported Lee. What enraged Lee and his allies was Hamilton's testimony that during the battle, Lee had lost his composure. On the court martial's first day in response to the prosecution, prosecution asking whether Lee's orders given on the day had been distinct and clear in a code language, Hamilton testified, I recollect to have heard General Lee give two orders. At both times, he seemed to be rather under a hurry of mind. Ooh. Uh, Lee always took great pride in his battlefield composure. As a soldier of fortune, having served in military capacities on two continents and for kings, it was crucial for him that others respected his calm and professional demeanor 
during a battle. And he was mostly calm, especially. Hamilton's accusations that he had lost his composure at Monmouth stung him deeply. In his defense at his court-martial, Lee countered Hamilton by assaulting the staff officer's character through a telling story about the battle. I'm gonna read, this is from the book, quoting. Lee uses a John Mercer in his closing and his closing statement to tell a story that made Hamilton look like a novice on the battlefield. After Washington had ordered Lee to make a stand with his troops at the hedgerow, Lee calmly declared to his superior that he would set an example to his men by being one of the last to leave the field. Hamilton then charged up to Lee at full gallop. Flourishing his sword, he excitedly exclaimed to Lee, I will stay here with you, my dear general, and die with you. Let us all die here rather than retreat. Such youthful ardor for death took Lee aback. Later, he described Hamilton as much flustered and in a sort of frenzy of valor. In his closing statement, Lee explained that his main goal at the hedgerow was to give the enemy a check in order to give him time, give time for the troops and his detachment to go across the, remember that watery ravine over the bridge and to gain time for General Washington to make a disposition of his army on a ridge behind that, that stream. The general had no intention of unnecessarily sacrificing the lives of the defenders at the hedgerow for his own. Resolving to teach this presumptuous aide de camp how a true general behave under fire, Lee asked Hamilton to observe him carefully and to mark whether he revealed any sign of agitation. Hamilton replied that Lee seemed tranquil and fully possessed of his faculties, key code names, code terms. The general then declared he was as ready to die in the upcoming struggle as was Hamilton himself, but that his first responsibility was to his men. And when the Continentals under his charge had safely retreated across the bridge, I don't care how soon we die, Hamilton said, uh, Lee said. A chasten, chasten Hamilton remained silent as Lee turned his attention to improving the defense at the hedgerow. Mercer's and Lee's uh, recital of this episode at the hedgerow succeeded as a biting counterattack counter against the young and impetuous Hamilton. And after the war, General Henry Knox and um, uh, John Adams used to laugh about uh, uh, Hamilton's uh, heat and effervescence at Monmouth. Hamilton, however, got the last laugh, last laugh. Lee was suspended from the army and he never returned. Here's his house in uh, Virginia, a photograph I took. Uh, Lee lived in only the, only the back existed and it was one level when Lee lived there. He had purchased the farm, uh, but uh, the house was very humble as you can see, just the back part and inside there were no walls. He was not a success as a uh, tobacco farmer. Uh, now, um, after the, the uh, when one year came up, he again insulted Congress. Congress suspended him permanently. And then uh, he came up to Philadelphia to sell his farm, to work with Robert Morris, but he caught a fever and he died in a Philadelphia tavern. He's buried here at Christ Church in Philadelphia. That's me, by the way. And here's a, a little uh, memorial to him by one of his biographers. This biographer was, yeah, he couldn't do any wrong. Lee couldn't do any wrong type of biographer, but uh, very nice that he paid for this uh, memorial back then. We're not actually sure sure where Lee is buried. He was buried uh, uh, a part uh, near the church, but then uh, that was uh, made into a road. So all the graves were moved and uh, it was never, Lee never had even a marker. He didn't have enough money to even have a marker. So one of the most famous generals in the Revolutionary War never even had a marker. Now, Hamilton, as I said, got the last laugh. Uh, the show, Hamilton. Um, Lynn manuel Miranda in his spectacular historical Broadway musical, Hamilton, presents the following exchange about Lee. See if you remember this. Hamilton, instead of me, he promotes Charles Lee makes him second in command. Lee, I'm a general, Wee. Hamilton, yeah, he's not the choice I would have gone with. He shits the bed at the Battle of Monmouth. Washington, everyone attack. Lee, retreat. Washington, attack. Lee, retreat. 
Washington, what are you doing, Lee? Get back up on your feet. Lee, but there's so many of them. Washington, I'm sorry. Is this not to your speed? Hamilton, Hamilton, ready, sir. Washington, have Lafayette take the lead. Hamilton, yes, sir. Lawrence, John Lawrence, a thousand soldiers die in a hundred degree heat. Lafayette, as we snatch a stalemate from the jaws of defeat. Hamilton, Charles Lee was left without a pot to piss in. This popular view of Lee's performance at Monmouth needs to change. A good starting point would be to reevaluate his court martial conviction and to appreciate that uh, Lee may have saved a good portion of the Continental Army at the Battle of Monmouth. Thank you, that concludes my presentation. You, can you unmute yourself, uh, Kimberly? Please. I can, yes. Here we go. And I'm going to take the spotlight off. There we go. <clears throat> Thank you very much <laughs> for your talk. That was very interesting and long awaited after we had to uh, reschedule you <laughs> after last year. So thank you for joining us. Um, we've got a few questions in the chat box, but I want to start off with what I found, something I found interesting is regarding the, uh, the sketch here yeah. that was made of uh, the cartoon of mm -hmm. Lee and the boot, uh, the general suspended. And you note in the book and you also noted in your talk that um, the officer who, who made this may not have met Lee in person. So that got me wondering, you know, what, was the public perception since this was such a noteworthy trial? And by the way, not unusual in, in um, the British Army, I think, for officers to actually request a court martial trial, you know, when they feel like they're being wronged, their reputation is being wronged in some way. And it, it often works out in their favor, obviously, to not work out in Lee's right. favor. But given that it's very possible that this was um, drawn by someone who never actually met him. It had made me wonder, what was the public perception of Lee uh, during and after the trial? Well, I think uh, during the trial, before the battle, I think it was fairly good, although there were some suspicions. How did he get captured so easily? Was he conniving with the British? Um, and, uh, but uh, after the battle, he took the blame. Um, uh, there was uh, you know, the defining rumor was that he retreated without authority and he ruined the good chance, the best chance America had of defeating the British Army. All total nonsense, but that's the, that was the um, narr narration that won the day. And during the trial, he was seen as attacking Washington. So he was not popular. As a matter of fact, after the trial, some of his uh, aides were almost attacked in a tavern because uh, Lee had insulted Washington and they were trying to defend Lee. So he was not popular. This is similar to, uh, you know, Eisenhower uh, 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 court-martialing General Patton during World War II or something like that. So it was, it was mm -hmm. a pretty big deal. Now I'm going to, uh, I don't think anyone's going to ask me the question, but okay. I'm, uh, I'm going to pretend that someone said, oh, I heard Charles Lee had a very sharp tongue and he was a very clever letter writer. What's your <laughs> Christian, what's your favorite letter of his? Oh, well, I'm going to read it. There's one particular from the book. Uh, this is from William Drayton. He was a South Carolina congressional delegate. During the Battle of Charleston in South Carolina, um, Lee had criticized him because he didn't, he said, well, you placed this cannon in the wrong position. You're not much of a general. You know, again, being harsh, but uh, being accurate, but harsh. So Drayton never liked him. And Drayton led the campaign against Lee uh, in the Continental Congress when it came to approving Lee's court-martial conviction. So um, uh, on February 3rd, 1779, uh, Drayton wrote to Lee reiterating his grand jury presentation. Lee's call for a response spared no insult. And I'm quoting, until very recently, I was taught to consider you as only a fantastic, pompous, dramatis persona, a mere Malvolio, never to be spoken of or thought of, but for the sake of laughter. And when the humor for laughter subsided, never to be spoken of or thought of more, he wrote. But I find I was mistaken. 
I find that you are as malignant a scoundrel as you are universally allowed to be a ridiculous and disgusting coxcomb. So um, I don't know oh if you've ever, you ever heard anyone being called a, um, a Malvolio and a coxcomb in the same sentence. Well, that would be a first for me. <laughs> I have one more question, then we'll get to the chat. Uh, as you're aware, Lee, uh, when he was captured, was very slowly <laughs> on his way uh, to uh, Pennsylvania to cross into Bucks County and what would ultimately be the uh, the encampment just prior to Washington crossing the Delaware. Now we know he he didn't get that far because he, for various reasons, was uh, not Russian to get here. Mm -hmm. After his release, he's given this, and I'd say a pretty good command. Was there any animosity on Washington's part that Lee um, took his time and therefore that resulted in his capture? And if there was, do you think that held over um, and I don't know, some of the remnants of, uh, of those feelings may have played a part in his court martial? Well, uh, Washington was happy that Lee was released. Um, he realized that Lee did, was an experienced general and frankly, uh, Washington didn't have a lot of experienced generals. They got more experience as the war went on. Of course, Nathaniel Green became the, probably the war's best field commander on either side. But he was happy to have him back at, at the battle of, uh, for example, he advised Washington, you need to get off of Manhattan Island. The British army is going to trap you. There's only one way out at Kingsbridge. We need to retreat there immediately. And Washington uh, listened and he appreciated that. But he also learned about, as you said, uh, Lee was going very slowly. I cover this in the Kidnapping the Enemy book. And I think he was actually trying to see if maybe Washington would be defeated and then maybe Lee could be raised to the top command or co-command. Right. Uh, but he was going forward. Um, and, uh, but Washington also found out, he opened a letter of Lee's in which Lee criticized Washington for being indecisive. So Washington knew, and also when Lee came back, he started spreading news, you know, he acted as if it was still back in November of 1776. You know, he was saying how Washington's a bad general. Uh, so Washington got word of that too, and actually advised him, you ought to stop that. So um, uh, it was, there was a mixed feelings between the two. And I think after the uh, effort to overturn uh, Washington's command uh, called the Conway Cabal, this happened shortly after that. Washington just got tired of people opposing him. So he was glad to be rid of Lee, I think, at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's see. Well, was, since you bring that up, one of the questions we got of the, the Conway Cabal was Lee directly involved in that? Or was this, um, what, as you said, Washington just, Washington just getting tired of, of being undermined all the time? I think the, more of the latter, Lee was not released till April 1778. So it was just, uh, that was after Conway's cabal. So he couldn't participate. But when Lee got back, he started consorting with a lot of the guys who were in Conway's cabal, Conway, Mifflin, and some of the others. So Washington took note of that. I, I think this is a, just a follow on to Conway's cabal that Lee was, uh, Washington was just a bit tired of uh, being uh, criticized. Um, behind his back and he wasn't happy about what happened with uh, at uh, Monmouth either, but he didn't quite understand what had happened either. All right, uh, one question. At Monmouth, General Lafayette is said to have rushed and outrun his supply and communication lines. What impact uh, did that have on the battle or on Lee's actions? Well, uh, first uh, Lee declined the command at uh, Monmouth, which I ex explain in the book. And he said a certain volunteering French general should be given the command, i.e. Lafayette. So Lafayette took the command, but he was not very experienced. I mean, he was still 19 years old. He never fought as a general in a battle, um, had a little bit of technical training at a military school. That's about it. And uh, Washington, uh, Lee, uh, excuse me, when Lafayette took his detachment to join the, uh, the rest of the troops following Clinton's army, he went very fast. It was very hot, so he tired out his troops, and he went beyond 
the, the troops that were chasing Wash uh, Clinton's army. And he exposed his uh, detachment to being attacked by the British. So it was lucky that it wasn't, but um, so it didn't ultimately harm Lee's efforts, but uh, it, it was also lucky that uh, Lafayette's detachment wasn't uh, overrun the day before the battle. All right, another question. My understanding is that one, a one year suspension was a relatively light punishment for the charges in comparison to being discharged. Is that your understanding as well? And do you think it was a light sentence because the court martial felt that the charges were overstated? Yes, um, in a word. Uh, he actually was charged three charges, uh, not attacking the enemy, uh, shameful and sometimes disorderly retreat and insulting the commander in chief. He definitely insulted the commander in chief. Uh, so <clears throat> I, most people think, and I think he, the one year suspension was for that. Uh, and, and that the uh, generals really on the court martial and colonels really didn't think he was guilty of the first two charges. So they didn't punish him for that. What was the British opinion of Charles Lee? Uh, they actually thought he was unfairly uh, um, charged, and uh, I mean, he and Clinton were kind of friendly, and and uh, Clinton said, "Hey, you know, if Lee had uh, hadn't have retreated, uh, I know what would have happened. I would have pinned his army against the ravine and uh, destroyed what detachment he had left." Uh, Benedict Arnold by then had just turned traitor, and he said, uh, "Oh, most Continental officers agreed that Lee got a bum deal, but." Uh, the, the rank and file just love Washington. So anyone who attacks Washington wasn't going to survive. So. And one more is about, um, <laughs> um, as you, you started, the uh, Lee and his dogs. <laughs> um, that Lee had a, a modern view of dogs and one is, um, let me see here. He had a modern view of dogs, one that we share, but my understanding was that his view of dogs was deemed unusual by his contemporaries. Is that accurate? Yes, that is accurate. Now, there was one famous scene when he was up in uh, uh, Massachusetts with the American army surrounding Boston in the siege of Boston. And he met uh, um, John Adams' wife. Help me out here. I've forgotten her name. Abigail. Adams. Abigail. I'm related. I'm related, <laughs> I'm related to John Adams. So that's really a bad thing. But he met Abigail and uh, he said, Abigail, come over here and say hello to Spada, my dog. And the dog got up on a chair and lifted her paw and said, oh, take, go ahead, Abigail, take the paw, dog's paw and shake it. So Abigail wrote about that later and said, uh, very extraordinary and unusual, you know. She was kind of shocked that that would happen. But of course, in today's society, it'd be very seen as charming. So I took, well, a, and, I took and, a this morning and I think I saw 35 dogs. So. <laughs> and of course, that's the question we have to end on because today is National Pet Day. So I think it's, you know, very relevant that we end on that question. <laughs> so I want to thank you very much for um for uh, speaking to us and remind everybody, I, I put it in the chat a couple of times. So uh, you know, if you are interested in getting a signed copy of the book, you can email editor at smallstatebighistory.com. The cost of the book is $20 plus $4 shipping for a total of $24. And Christian will be happy to uh, send that out to you. Or they can um, if you, have, you. Or they if can you have any questions, you can send them to me or send them to that email address and we'll be happy to get back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Glad to be here. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.